Hi. Uh, I want to give everyone a warm welcome for joining us for GMF Digital's first um, webinar. Uh, we're hoping that it goes relatively smoothly. I'm Karen Kornblu. I'm the director of GMF's Digital Innovation and Democracy Initiative. Uh, GMF Digital works to ensure that technology strengthens democracy. Um, and with that in mind, we produced a report uh, last week on safeguarding uh, digital democracy, a roadmap for future work that we're going to be doing, and five steps to combat the infodemic, which we're very pleased to be presenting today with this stellar um, I'm just going to introduce quickly Emily Bazelon. We're very grateful to Emily for moderating. She is, of course, a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine, as well as a Truman Capote Fellow for Creative Writing and Law at Yale Law School. She's the author of two, international, uh, two national bestsellers, as well as the co-host of Slate's uh, podcast, Political Gab Fest. Um, thank you, Emily. We're very grateful to you for, for moderating today. No problem. Um, I'm glad to be here with everyone. Um, so I'm here, of course, with Karen Kornblaw and Ellen Goodman from the German Marshall Fund and Ellen Weintraub, who is a commissioner for the Federal Election Commission. And these are three people who are thinking deeply about some of the biggest um, issues and challenges we face in our current media environment, both online and offline. Um, it's important to remember that sometimes we focus a great deal on the rules for the internet, um, which are super important, but there's also a close relationship and even a kind of reinforcing cycle between new media and traditional media as they kind of feed each other. So um, Karen and Ellen, um, Ellen Goodman that is, have written this really interesting report and set of guidelines about how to think of democracy in this digital era and very concretely how to deal with some of the main challenges we're facing in terms of what they and others call an infodemic. Um, and that is an interesting term which I'm sure they'll talk more about but involves thinking about how information and also both misinformation, meaning mistakes, and disinformation, kind of deliberate efforts to mislead or manipulate people, how they're flowing through social media platforms, through search engines like Google, um, in and out of major news websites, and, and particularly what we should do to try to make sure to protect the health of the democracy and make that a, a paramount value. Um, as we look forward to the November 2020 election. This conversation, of course, has gotten um, entangled with concerns about the coronavirus. Um, the social media platforms and Google say that they're doing a great deal to try to combat the spread of misinformation, things like false promises of cures for the pandemic. Um, and that has both shown a different kind of light on their efforts and also I think in some ways distracted from the conversation about protecting the election. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Karen to start with. Um, with, with. They're going to present the plan that they have, the challenges they see, and then some of the solutions that they propose for um, charting a course forward. And then I should say we'll take questions. Ellen Weintraub will comment and then we'll also take questions from the audience. Thanks so much, Emily. Yeah, and just to remind folks, there's a Q&A button where you can submit your questions to Emily and she'll choose. And if you could also, um, Emily, I think you said you wanted people to give their um, affiliation. So if you could. Yeah, that. that would be great. Name and organization, if you don't mind. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. And I hope we'll pick up on, on some of those points that you made, especially the bleeding between the new media and traditional media. Um, so we can start the presentation. Um, great. Uh, that worked. Yay. Um, so despite the concerted effort that Emily was talking about um, by each of the platforms to combat even disinformation, misinformation about the virus, uh, Eli um, Weiner on the GMF staff uh, did a study of the 
uh, sites that, that have been found to repeatedly publish false or misleading information. These are the sites that pretend to be news, so the worst of the worst. They pretend to be news, they don't even say that they're doing opinion, but they're publishing demonstrably false or misleading information um, as rated by NewsGuard. And eight of the top 10 of these sites uh, are now pushing coronavirus content. So this includes RT and Sputnik, but also a number of sites that don't seem to be um, representing a foreign nation state, nor are they particularly partisan, but they engage in uh, health, wellness, and um, similar kinds of content that, uh, that undermines confidence in science and confidence in, a, in a authority. So we see this happening already on the coronavirus. Uh, we've also seen recently um, uh, some complications with how the platforms enforce even the rules that they do have. So um, uh, an interesting example was that Facebook had agreed to um, uh, and expand its terms of service to include um, not allowing misinformation about the census. And then uh, the Trump campaign actually ran an ad that appeared to be um, census related, appeared to be that if you would respond to this ad, uh, you would be filling out the census when in fact you were uh, giving your information to the campaign. And there was a tussle, a back and forth in public about whether Facebook would enforce the rules that they had um, put forward and agreed to. Uh, at first they said they would leave this up. Then uh, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights pushed back and said, hey, we, you know, we know that this is against your own terms of service. And finally they did take it down. Just another graphic example. Um, the day of the Iowa caucuses, uh, there was a, um, uh, a tweet that came out, a, a seeming news item uh, from Judicial Watch claiming voter fraud. Uh, the Secretary of State in Iowa uh, responded and said, this is a false claim. Um, uh, this is not true. Go to our website if you want more information. And it was just interesting in light of the fact that the platforms each do their own terms of service, their own enforcement, uh, make their own decisions about how they're going to handle things, that this was handled completely differently by Twitter and Facebook. Twitter left it up. Uh, Facebook put on a, a screen on top of the posting so that you, before you shared it, you had to acknowledge that you knew that it was false. So this shows us what goes on when we have um, each platform doing things its own way. So uh, we looked at a lot of these examples and a lot more, and, and what we realized is that the United States is woefully unprepared for the disinformation wars. And we've left ourselves exposed in this way, uh, in part because the platforms themselves uh, have allowed, have left loopholes and allowed uh, those spreading disinformation to operate on their platforms. And I'll just run through this really quick. Again, this is in our longer report that was left yesterday, but just highlight some big ones. There's digital astroturf, which is what we call um, folks who form and penetrate the secret groups. For example, on Facebook, we famously heard about the Russian group Blacktivist. Uh, that pretended to be a Black Lives Matter group. Uh, Heart of Texas was another Russian one. Um, uh, this continues. We're seeing that now with veterans groups, police force groups uh, being uh, set up and infiltrated by folks spreading radicalization, white nationalism. Uh, personalized propaganda. This is something that Ellen Weintraub knows all about. The micro-targeting that tests messages on very small audiences targets them, uh, this election is going to see um, three times more money spent on, on this kind of digital advertising than in 2016. Uh, flooding the zone. Um, so it's not just, it's not only micro-targeting ads, it's not only foreign state actors, but, but Kate Starbird at the University of Washington and others have done uh, terrific work showing that there are these domestic volunteers or domestic warriors that are coordinating and flooding the news cycle with fakes, with memes, with rumors, um, to the extent that Twitter now takes down some of these 
um, coordinated efforts, even when they're done by real people, uh, because they say they violate their spam rules. They're so coordinated, they look like bots. And then there's the moderation black box. We were showing you examples of that before, that the platforms each have their own ways of moderating and we're never quite sure how they're gonna enforce, how they're gonna implement, what's happened, what appeals are possible. And Trojan horse outlets, this is a term that Ellen Goodman came up with. Um, uh, for all these different sites uh, that don't follow traditional uh, journalistic um, practices, she's gonna talk about this more, uh, but look on a platform indistinguishable from those that have a masthead, uh, have bylines, have codes and standards, and are truly independent. So just to run through, this is um, uh, our approach is, is to reject the false choice that you hear all too often between uh, giving platforms more uh, ability to censor or giving the government more ability to censor. We don't feel that either of those is the way to address this problem. It's not top down uh, government control any more than it's uh, hidden platform control. That the answer instead is much more user control. Uh, and to do that, we have five recommendations that are, these are the urgent ones that we feel are needed in this time of the infodemic, which is what the World Health Organization has called the disinformation that's circulating about the pandemic. Um, Ellen's gonna talk to you about the one we think is most urgent, which is um, how to address uh, the, um, the crisis that's affecting journalism. And we propose a super fun type tax and PBS and the internet, she'll explain what we mean by that. I'll quickly go through uh, what we call light patterns to boost credible information and power uh, consumers, uh, and then um, uh, how we can have an accountable code of conduct and hold the platforms responsible for implementing it. And then we're gonna turn it over to Ellen Weintraub, who's going to discuss with us micro-targeted ads. Over to you, Ellen Goodman. Thanks, Karen. Um, so the way our sort of theory of, um, of change that's reflected in this report and the way we think about this is, is to ask what is the role of media policy? Um, what has it been and what can it be here? And our view is that um, what media policy has always done is to adopt structural market interventions uh, and also to push for private actions to augment signal over noise. Um, in other words, what media policy is for is to promote high fidelity information. So in the case of platforms, um, Signal is credible information, uh, especially accountability journalism. And um, media policy has always uh, enacted um, uh, structural interventions and subsidies uh, to support news, local information, civic engagement, and also diverse sources. So that signal. Noise is, is um, uh, some of the things that Karen was talking about, you know, fakes, hate speech, disinformation. So we know that policy can't generally limit noise by fiat, um, but what it can do is target interventions to support individuals in filtering out noise, as it did with spam, um, as it as did to some extent with violence. Uh, so policy can also get platforms voluntarily to reduce engagement with noise um, and to reduce the tendency of noise to flood signal. And it can do this um, uh, through transparency and other interventions that Karen will talk about um, a bit later. Next slide. So um, Craig Silverman has called um, uh, the coronavirus uh, a media extinction event. Um, we know that market structures have already been um, pushing most ad revenue to platforms um, and have been you know, pretty rapidly taking newspapers out of business. We don't have the data yet, but we see newsroom after newsroom um, during uh, the COVID crisis laying off reporters uh, and weeklies have um, almost stopped publishing entirely. So that's on top of the slide on the left shows what um, has already been happening over the last 12 years of newsroom decimation, especially for newspapers, uh, which do most of the country's accountability reporting. Um, and then on the right, 
you can see it over the past 15 years, we've lost the places where we've lost um, about 2,000 papers or about 20% of the total, leaving news deserts without any news at all. Local news, that is. Next page. Um, so there are a lot of reasons for this, uh, but the biggest reason is the growth of digital ad revenue at the expense of print. And while the flagship national news organizations have been able to shift uh, to subscription models, that's not been possible um, for most locals. Uh, and of course, as you see on the right, the vast majority of these digital dollars are going to Google and Facebook. Um, which brings us uh, to our, our major, major proposal um, for boosting signal. And this is what we're calling a super fund tax uh, to fund a PBS of the internet. So we propose um, taxing the targeted ad revenue of the largest digital platforms, those that achieve um, market dominance. And we could talk about definitions of that. Um, and the tax would be used to fund high fidelity information or signal. And for many years, I and others have advocated new digital models um, for public service media to address market failures. Free Press um, has a proposal, media scholar Victor Picard, journalist Steve Waldman, and Emily Bell, um, uh, public knowledgeist Harold Feld, and most recently, the economist Paul Romer and the technologist Ethan Zuckerman um, have all come around to, the, to this view and have their own proposals. The two biggest issues for all of these proposals are how to fund it and what to fund. So by calling it a super fund tax, um, what we hope to do is to point out that the ads based on micro-targeting and surveillance are a form of pollution. And taxing such ads is a way not only of paying for signal, um, but also of reducing the negative externalities that advertising imposes in terms of privacy, in terms of um, information costs, and also anti-competitive data acquisition that makes new entry into these um, platform markets very difficult. We've used uh, PBS for the internet as shorthand. Um, of course, PBS is a content network uh, at the top of what we might call a public service media stack. What should be funded um, to boost signal and what people are now talking about um, as a new stimulus does include content, content especially at the local level, um, and you know, especially now health and emergency information. But we are also thinking about other parts of the information stack. Um, Indeed, the public media system has always included telecoms infrastructure like satellite connections, broadcast towers, spectrum, uh, and school partnerships. And we're seeing now how public media is working with school districts and libraries to provide online education and connectivity so that the public isn't totally reliant on, on Google. So in sum, we imagine support for a civic information infrastructure. Um, now, there is a small pilot of this that's now happening uh, in New Jersey. New Jersey um, uh, allocated a portion of the revenue that it received from auctioning its television broadcast spectrum um, and by statute created a, an independent public charity, um, which is essentially a collaboration among the state's five leading public colleges and universities. Uh, and they are deciding who um, will get grants, eligible grantees, uh, have to propose collaborations that connect a higher ed partner with a media outlet or an NGO or a tech company to produce um, civic information. I'll turn it back over to Karen. Sorry, I was muted. I'm going to quickly go through these others. Um, one of the uh, terms of art that's used in um, talking about online content and user interface is dark patterns. Uh, a dark pattern is something like what you see on the left of the screen that you've seen on website after website. When you go on, they say we use cookies and they pretend to give you choice, but they don't. The really only the choice is I'm okay with that. And then if you want to spend an hour clicking through various other 
pages, you can click on more information, and probably never really figure out how to get access to the content without giving up uh, your, your uh, privacy. Uh, so that's, that's traditionally called a dark pattern. It's lack of transparency and user design that really limits user choice. So we wanted to steal that term and turn it on its head and expand it and say, if you want to dampen the noise, what you really need to do are have light patterns. Light patterns are offer the user more control. They give the user transparency, but also intuitive user interface to use it. So probably a, a label up in the corner uh, that says click here to learn more is not going to tell you that the content is false um, uh, and has been fact checked such. Um, so we want something that's like nutrition labels that really lets users understand what kind of content they're seeing and what the source of it is. And there should be a lot more research and we're going to be working with folks in the design world and the tech world to figure out what really works in terms of communicating to people in that intuitive lizard, lizard brain way. Uh, how to downrank fakes and frauds. That means not amplify them as much. Um, how to default easily out of data sharing, how to default easily out of being tested and targeted. Senator Warner and others have introduced legislation which gets at this point, which is that we're all research subjects in a way online, constantly being tested on and targeted um, as if we're in a Skinner box. Usually researchers have rules about how they work on human subjects. Um, we should at the very least be able to default out of that and there should probably be best practices and a lot more rules on how that is done. Also defaulting out of algorithmic amplification and recommendations. Um, I always think of, you know, when I'm doing e-commerce and looking at shoes, I can sort by least expensive to most, by heel height, by whether they're for work or for weekends. Um, but I don't have that kind of choice, except maybe on Twitter where I can see, just show me the most recent tweets versus show me what you think I'd want to see based on what's most popular. You should have a lot more choice in terms of how your newsfeed is structured and what is amplified. So we have a lot of research behind each of these and we'll be doing a lot more, but that's what we mean by light patterns. And then very quickly, again, this is one that requires a lot more discussion, but obviously there needs to be a, a code of conduct to make sure that there aren't these loopholes left when one platform has one rules and another platform has different rules and they enforce them differently. Um, and they endorse them, uh, enforce them differently for different kinds of um, advertisers or users. Uh, and, but that kind of code of conduct has been tried before. Obviously, the EU has one on disinformation. After the terrible terrorist event in New Zealand, there was a Christchurch call to action where there was another code of conduct that was agreed. Clearly, there needs to be more information sharing about what's going on and how these are being um, uh, implemented in order for them to be enforced. Um, the reason we know so much about Russian interference in the 2016 election is because the Senate Intelligence Committee required information be shared about what had happened, and that's how researchers were able to learn so much about what had, what had happened, how African American community had been targeted. We need that kind of data that's released, just as when a, an airplane goes down, uh, the National Transportation um, uh, Safety board can go in and get the black box, uh, flight data recorder. We need that kind of data available to researchers or to civil society or to a government agency to find out what's been happening. We need moderation logs and an ability to appeal. And to get these groups to the table, we may even need to look at, at, at culling back on Section 230 immunity um, so that they, they have some incentive to come to the table. And we can talk about all that more, all that a lot more. Um, but that, that runs through the first four of our steps. And we've only touched very little on uh, micro targeted ads, which are such a major issue, especially regarding the election. I want to turn that over to Ellen Weintraub, who's the real expert on that. Well, thank you, Karen. Uh, and, uh, and Ellen and Emily, it's really a, a pleasure to be here with you all. It's a very interesting and provocative uh, new report. And I'm uh, I'm particularly excited at the user empowerment and transparency-based 
recommendations uh, because I'm all about the transparency. And my proposal on micro-targeting is also about transparency because um, the problem with micro-targeting is that the, the platforms have become so sophisticated in, in helping uh, folks target their ads that it's, it's, it's become almost individualized. They suck all this data out of everything that we do online and and we're not even conscious of giving them this data about ourselves. And they use that to almost profile us and give us individualized ads that are gonna to appeal to all of our biases and, and we all have them uh, and inclinations. And when that happens, you're getting a different ad than, it's not like broadcast anymore where everybody's watching the same show sees the same ads. You're gonna see a different ad, not only from your neighbor, but possibly from the person who's sitting across the dinner table from you. And uh, when you're getting those kinds of really narrow casting, uh, micro-targeted ads, there isn't the opportunity for what our First Amendment jurisprudence provides as the ultimate response to bad information. If you don't like what somebody else is saying, then you should get out there and say something to the contrary. And that kind of counter speech is really negated by micro-targeting. So what I have proposed is that we just broaden the field. So rather than having these really isolated micro-targeted uh, ads, that the platforms, and again, I'm not proposing this as government regulation, but the platforms should uh, not allow those ads to be targeted in such narrow slices. And the platforms have come up with different uh, solutions to this on their own. Um, we've got Twitter that said they're just not going to run political ads at all, and they've even had trouble trying to implement that because it turns out it's harder than it looks like to try and figure out what a political ad is. Uh, we've got Facebook that says, no, we're just, you know, not going to get into that at all. And, you know, people want to run their ads. That's our business model. So we're going to allow it for, uh, for political ads the way we allow it for selling soap. Uh, and, you know, what I would say to them and what I have said to them is that democracy is not soap. And maybe we should have different rules to make sure that our democracy really does encourage the most robust debate. And that means that people have to be able to engage with each other and the ideas have to be um, broadly enough disseminated so that people can engage uh, on these ideas. Now, Google has come up with a different model, which is probably the closest to the one that I've suggested. Uh, they say they're not gonna allow micro-targeting below the range of, uh, I think it's gender, age, and zip code. Now, you know, zip codes could be about 8,000 people. So that's still pretty micro-targeted. They're not a, a, that's not a huge number of people. Um, so I, I, I would like to see a, a broader range. I have suggested uh, we should go by political units. If you're, if you're running um, at a statewide race, you could go one unit down uh, from whatever your, um, uh, the political uh, range that you're running in. If you're running at the presidential level, you could go two levels down. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not wedded to particular numbers, but I think it's got to be a broad enough dissemination so that people can really engage. And this is particularly important now at a time when we don't have water coolers to group around anymore. We're all at home. We're having less interpersonal interaction. We're having less opportunities to uh, engage face to face. So we need to make sure that the information that people are are consuming about their democracy that's going to inform the electorate and help them make decisions is, is good, solid, well-debated, well-vetted information. And, and I think one way to do that is to limit micro-targeting of these ads. Um, thank you all. That's all super interesting. Um, I'm going to kick this off with a few questions of my own. So I think this is probably for Karen. When you talk about a false choice between government control and platform control and handing things off instead to users, I think about how the current dark patterns you're um, highlighting often make me feel kind of overwhelmed as a user. You're just trying to get some content. You're, one tends to just click on the accept button to get past whatever the barrier is. Um, and I, when I'm in Europe um, and under the regulations there called the GDPR, which have more privacy controls, I find myself getting kind of impatient. So when you think of replacing these dark patterns with light patterns, 
how are you going to get past that problem of just feeling users feeling like they don't want to deal with barriers to what they want to see? How do we really make it so that users have control that is um, is something that is actually useful to them? Yeah, that's that's exactly the question, and and I'd love Ellen to Ellen uh, Goodman to respond as well, but. Um, that's exactly the problem is that I think, um, you know, GDPR says that you're not supposed to be able to condition access to the service uh, with agreeing to uh, give up certain information, but the effect of the user interface of those frustrating screens that you just mentioned is to undermine the letter of the law. So, yes, it's theoretically possible for you not to agree, but it's so difficult and frustrating. And so that's really where, um, where uh, the gap is between the law and the user experience and the user's reality. And so we want to do, a, um, what we feel is really important is uh, to think through the user interface, to think through the reality of how this functions. And um, there, are, there are a number of ways you could enforce it. It could be through a code of conduct by the platforms where they decide what to do. It could be an agency enforcing it. But the bottom line is that we need to do some research on what's really effective and there needs to be a lot more work on intuitive user design that really helps create what Ellen Goodman has called friction. You know, it's really easy to share misinformation. It's really hard to say, no, I don't want to share my information. No, you know, let me find out a little bit more about that. And what I always think about is when you used to go to the newsstand, um, the different kinds of, of uh, content was organized in different places. And then even when you picked up a paper like the New York Times uh, or the Wall Street Journal or even the New York Post, uh, you would have the opinions separated from what claimed to be news, probably in part because of libel law. Um, you can sue for um, something that's in the news section, not what's in the opinion section. You would have a masthead where you would get all kinds of information about the editorial chain of command. If you went to their office, you could find out about their codes and standards, but you kind of intuited what it was because there was a traditional um, uh, tradition of what codes and standards would be. There was a byline, there was a date line. So, that's a kind of user interface that was intuitive. You know, I got to know that if I was reading from the back, it was opinion. If I was reading at the front, it was news and so on. And we, we haven't developed those traditions at all. And um, because people have grown to trust something that has a certain font to it and looks like news, there's almost this arbitrage that's going on, this trust arbitrage, where people are taking the, the remnants of the trust that they had for news and putting it on anything that looks like that online. And what's happening is that the trust in main traditional journalism is, is falling. And, um, and unfortunately, there's a little too much lifting up of the, um, of the Trojan horse outlets that look like their news. But Ellen Goodman, you're, you're thinking a lot more strongly about what kind of research we can do to make that kind of light pattern work. Yeah, I mean, I think so, you know, GDPR is an example of something that's not a well designed interface, as, as you point out, Emily, and it's, it comes out of, you know, a privacy law, and it's not really a media law. Um, and so I think we need to think about media laws that use friction appropriately. And so some things you want to make easy. So you want to have default opt out so that you're not um, and, and that a code of conduct would implement a sort of threshold where you're not being asked constantly, um, do you want to opt in um, to things? And then, but you do want some things to have friction. And so, you know, I think WhatsApp has implemented this voluntarily on um, sharing. Uh, and it's, it's to sort of keep a lid on certain amounts of virality. And that's also built into um, our Section 230 proposal is to keep an eye, you know, a lot of this stuff, this disinformation stuff just doesn't matter that much if it's under a threshold of virality. And so, um, but once it tips over a threshold of virality, you want to have sort of more responsibility for it. Um, same thing for friction. You want certain amounts of friction to make certain kinds of virality more difficult and other things should be easier. And that's where the light patterns come in. 
That all makes sense. Um, I want to come back to Section 230 because there's a question about that in the queue. But let me first bring in Ellen Weintraub. So um, at the end of micro-targeting for political ads, um, how do you make sure that applies to issue ads? Uh, I mean, you mentioned how Twitter is having trouble defining what political ads are. Does some of that confusion come from the distinction between candidate run ads and then the PACs or other organizations that support them? Um, and how does how would your micro targeting solution um, address that issue? And then why not just ban this kind of political ad period, um, given that it is using micro-targeting a strategy for commerce and that it just seems like the platform struggles so much with what to do about the spread of um, false and misleading ads, doctored videos, et cetera. Is the Twitter solution, while it um, suppresses more speech, it also, is it more in line with the democratic value of just making sure that we're having a healthy discourse um, with accurate information? Well, I don't, I don't know how uh, one promotes discourse by banning it altogether. That, that seems counterintuitive to me. Um, uh, like it or not, more and more political discourse is migrating online. I've seen estimates that uh, people are predicting almost $3 billion will be spent on political advertising online this year. Uh, and it's really skyrocketed. It, the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the graph line of, of money that is going towards uh, digital as opposed to traditional broadcast and newspaper advertising is really very, very dramatic. So, um, you know, just blocking off that entire way of communicating with people, I'm, I, I, I don't know, excuse me, I don't know that that is the, the best solution. It's not the one that, that I am recommending. Um, I, I think that it is important for people to be able to engage in these debates. Now, you know, Twitter debates are not always the most illuminating debates, but it is, it is a place where people gather to express their political views. Um, and, uh, and it certainly is a place that gets attention, right? So if somebody says something on Twitter, it is public and people can find it and people can respond to it and react to it and say, no, that's not true. Uh, and, and, you know, the other platforms are, are actually a little bit less public, depending on, on how people have their Facebook settings and uh, uh, what, they're, what they're seeing in their, in their news feeds and, and what, what Facebook is, how Facebook is adjusting the, the news feed algorithms. Uh, I, I've been trying recently to uh, co-opt the algorithms for myself by trying to click on more positive stories lately so that it will continue to send me more positive stories, thinking that that's the way to get my engagement. But I think we all need to be super careful these days about the sources of what we are, are seeing online. And is this going to require some um, hard decision making about what is political? Yes, I mean, this is an issue that we have struggled with at the FEC and, uh, and, and I've been frustrated by some of the decisions that have been made by the FEC on, what, on the distinction between direct uh, advocacy for candidates versus issue ads that seem like they were pretty darn close to directly advocating. Um, uh, I think that, that better lines could be drawn, but you know, to throw up one's hands and say, well, we shouldn't even try, we should just let it be a uh, free for all, I think is, is not the right response. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to call up a question from John Bergmeier at Public Knowledge, um, who says, I love the report. That's nice. Um, and he wanted to ask a question about recommendation number four about section 230 of the Communications and Decency Act about your recommendations to modify that. So John is asking, what would be the underlying cause of action against a platform for spreading misinformation, assuming 230 is removed? So assuming no more protection from Section 230. Are the original publishers liable under any particular legal theory as it stands? So I'll, I'll let Ellen Goodman answer this, but um, we're not talking about completely removing 230, um, but I'll, I'll let her explain. Yeah, so first of all, I want to say um, John Bergemeyer at Public Knowledge has um, a really interesting proposal of his own, which um, we, we incorporated into this, um, which is 
uh, to remove Section 230 liability um, from advertisements that the platforms um, uh, receive money for, um, which makes a lot of sense. But the, the question goes to sort of a fundamental point about the limits of 230 and to playing around with 230, which is that um, removing 230 immunity, however much immunity was removed, and as Karen says, we, we advocate removing some portion of it, but not um, uh, a huge amount of it. Um, removing Section 230 immunity only exposes platforms to what they would ordinarily be liable for. And so when we're talking about disinformation, that's, there generally is no liability for disinformation that is not commercial disinformation. Um, and so uh, I think that the premise of the question is that, um, you know, it, it, would it really make much of a difference? And I think the answer to that is, first of all, there are things that they would be liable for um, uh, under our proposal that they are not liable for now. But we also think, um, Karen, I think, used the expression of getting, getting the, the platforms to the table. Um, it, there's a way in which I, you know, having um, responsibility for content, even though there wouldn't likely be that much liability, creates some sense of, of moral hazard for the platforms. And um, me, media publishers tell us this all the time, that even though they're not really worried about liability for certain kinds of content, it makes them more careful and sort of exercise more editorial responsibility when they know that they can be um, they can be sued. And so um, it's as much of a culture change as a, as a legal change that we're after. Um, so I have a couple of questions from Soren Ayanita. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. The first one is to ask whether these proposals and presentations are available in written form um, for future, future reference. Um, and I know the report is online, but maybe you could give some details about the slides and presentation today. Um, and then Soren's substantive question, he, he or she, sorry, asks, how do these proposals play in the context of the European Union's regulatory model? Not just GDPR, but also the upcoming discussion about taxing technology multinationals. We in Europe anticipate a lot of heat in the next two to three years when these issues are negotiated across the water. Um, thanks so much. So the... Um... There are both uh, the five steps and the broader report are available in GMF's uh, website, but um, also should be available in the invitation um, to this webinar. Um, uh, it's really, uh, we will be doing a subsequent piece uh, about how these rules, these rule changes, these steps uh, could be implemented in the slightly different environment of, of Europe. But it's very interesting that, um, and, and our work has been informed by some of the discussions that have been going on in Europe about the Digital Services Act. Um, of course, uh, hate speech, there are hate speech laws in Europe, which there are not in the US uh, in the same way at all. Um, but this idea of um, thinking about uh, what, how, how immunity works and what kind of affirmative obligations there are versus um, passive obligations. There's a lot of really interesting thinking going on, also about data, as Ellen talked about, data as a competitive issue, that if you have a lot of access to data, you can keep competitors, new entrants out of the market. So I think the, the dialogue between the US and Europe is, is very important on these issues. Um, uh, because we can learn from each other, but also the challenges are so global. The platforms are global. The disinformation campaigns are global. Um, the virus and the scientific information is global. Uh, so we have to improve um, our conversations about this. And there are going to be a bunch of frictions. There's going to be friction on tax. There's going to be friction on privacy. There's going to be friction on competition and so on. But, uh, you know, uh, what we have in common uh, in the transatlantic space is a commitment to democracy. And what we're talking about here is how do we preserve democratic values in this new media environment? And uh, just as we had a lot of dialogue when we came up with various rubrics on how we were gonna deal with the broadcast era, I think we, we need those conversations in this current era. Um, I have a question here from Lisa McPherson at Public Knowledge. What's your impression of the platform's efforts specifically on COVID-19? 
And what else should they be doing to counter misinformation and shape social behaviors in response to the pandemic? Sorry, I think I muted myself there. Did I? No, no, you didn't. A Ellen okay, or Ellen, good. whether if you want to respond to that. I think maybe one of you should uh, take that because <laughs> my space is more the election space than the public health space. Fair enough. Um, it's been it's been really interesting. I think what one of the interesting things that people point to is that the platforms have been somewhat more aggressive. So they've actually taken down content from uh, heads of state in Venezuela and um, and Brazil. They've taken down uh, even Rudy Giuliani in the U.S. talking about. Uh, cures, um, so they've been more aggressive, and I think, I think it's interesting. I, I think probably what they would say is that um, uh, it, it's they're not as nervous about suppressing political speech, um, and probably also they feel a little more comfortable with the black and white science here. But it raises a lot of questions about why is it so difficult when it comes to climate, for example. Or the thing I was talking about at the very beginning about how a lot of the disinformation regarding health and science has this political sheen to it because it undermines um, trust in authorities and in the government and in and in science. Uh, Eli uh, Weiner is going to be doing a um, a, a separate uh, posting about this uh, that this sort of political aspect to the health and wellness disinformation. So, um, so it's been it's been interesting. It's been different. It's been illuminating, and I think it just casts into stark relief how important uh, these issues are. And and for some reason, we we haven't been taking them as serious as we should in the election space, but they seem really stark in the in the pandemic space. I'll just add add to that. Uh, I mean, it's it's hard to say how well they've been doing because we haven't really seen data. We just we just know about the the their anecdotal responses. But I will say that um, you know we've known that the platforms have carved out areas where they are willing to act because they think um, that that there is a definite um, truth. Uh, things like and that where the harm is especially great, the census, um, voting. Uh, they have said they will take clear action, and so COVID seems to be um, another one of those areas. You know, there is this is not a black and white area, right? So. Um, you know, don't wear a mask, wear a mask. Um, I, and, I, and so I think it actually shows what is possible. Um, so science is also um, changing and truth, there are shades of truth. And so to me, it just points out that they are acting with editorial responsibility um, and that it's, it's not unreasonable to expect that kind of editorial responsibility in other areas too. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, this question is coming in from Andre Goodfriend, who's a US Foreign Service officer and politely says, thank you for continuing this program in a digital format. Um, Andre points out that the rise in individual unfiltered voices, bloggers, wiki contributors, tweeters, has seen a corresponding rise in the distrust of traditional media. So on the one hand, we're asking news consumers to be more discerning and digitally literate while also asking them to rely on the credibility of news sources with better editorial controls, like the ones that have a civic information infrastructure. Um, and so Andre's point is that even light patterns require an element of trust in whoever's evaluating the sources and veracity of the information. So the question is, how do we rebuild news consumer trust in, quote, mainstream media while still promoting the skepticism that is integral to digital literacy? Um, and I think this is such a key question because sometimes in our efforts to um, explore and highlight what all the misinformation online, we risk having people throw up their hands and just feeling like they can't trust anything. If I can jump in here, I mean, I, that is a, a, that's a beautiful question, very nuanced. And I, I think um, this is really a question that journalists and, and um, news organizations are struggling with um, recognize the importance of rebuilding um, that trust and so are working things like being being more connected to the community, having a more community-led um, 
uh, sort of ascertainment effort about wh where the news hole is and, and, and what stories they should be covering and, and to do sort of partnerships with communities about covering them. That's definitely um, central to that New Jersey news consortium um, pilot that I mentioned. Um, it's central to how public media entities are, are trying to involve the community and be more transparent. So um, I think it's very much, uh, it's probably, you know, beyond, besides revenue, it's the number one concern of journalistic organizations. And I'll just add, I mean, I think, I think there, what we're talking about with the light patterns is, again, a distributed model. So it's less um, that somebody's going to say this is true or false and judge the content and more that there's going to be more transparency and more optionality, if you will, um, about how you respond to content. So just as when you pick up a newspaper on the newsstand, um, you know where to look for the masthead and you can just even if you don't read the masthead, you know there is a masthead. Um, it's transparency. Um, and so I think, you know, being able to look at a site online and have a sense about where the information came from. I mean, I'll give you an example that, that struck me the more I learned about this. There are sites that um, are full of what they consider opinion pieces and they'll sneak in a could or a would or a should in the middle of the content, but if you were reading it, you would think they were claiming to be news. But because they claim to be opinion, they don't go through the fact checking of the platforms. Now the platforms, as we know, there's totally insufficient numbers of fact checking. It has to be a user request and then it gets in a queue and then maybe it'll be fact checked and then what happens when it is fact checked false. But opinion pieces and satire pieces don't even go through that process. Um, and when you see that piece of content online, completely divorced from the outlet it came from, you often have no idea that it, it would, that the outlet itself says we're a satire site or we're an opinion site. All you see is that it doesn't have a fact check on it. And so since you've seen some things that have a fact check on them, you think, well, this must be fine. Or you might think that there've been some studies that, that suggest people do think that. So that's the kind of a faulty user interface um, uh, that doesn't give you the, the information that you need. Where did this come from? Is it claiming to be satire? Is it claiming to be opinion? Is it not fact checked? Or when you see something um, that comes from a traditional or uh, uh, an outlet that does use um, more um, transparent uh, techniques, you don't know that that comes from an outlet that has a masthead that gives you that kind of transparency. You just see the, um, uh, the piece of content. So I, I, when we're talking about light patterns, it's, it's giving you that kind of information in an intuitive way and an ability to use it, which is very difficult when it's a tiny, you know, box on your screen. So that's where the, the design experts have to come in. Um, it's a question <laughs> from, yeah. Sorry, if I could just throw in uh, a thought sure. on that also, Emily, because I think that this broader question also bleeds over into the election space. Um, there, there oh, is a concerted effort out there to undermine Americans' faiths in a lot of our institutions, not just um, uh, media, but also in our democratic institutions, and to and to sow doubt about the results and and um, potentially create a, a real crisis of of faith in our in our democracy and in its reliability for American citizens. This is the sort of message that the Russians were promoting in 2016, and I think that when uh, U.S. citizens pile on and, and amplify those messages, they, they ought to be cognizant that they are really uh, singing out of the Russian hymnal on that. And, uh, and this is, th these kinds of messages are dangerous for our democracy. Can, can I, can I um, Emily, do you mind if I just follow on with that question to Ellen? Because some of these light patterns could also apply to, to ads, to political ads. I mean, what, do you have thoughts about the labeling of ads and how that works online and, and also these databases uh, that are supposed to be providing some transparency to users? 
Absolutely. This is something that uh, I am frustrated to say that the FEC has been struggling with since 2011 to provide greater transparency just on the face of the ads that we see online. And I have been advocating hard for uh, ensuring that it's not just some little box in the corner that somebody could easily miss and then they have to click on to find out what the source of the information is. If you don't know where the information is coming from, how are you to assess its credibility at all? So uh, I think this is an area where uh, the FEC needs to step up and right now we don't have enough commissioners to do a rulemaking, but um, should we uh, regain a quorum, it would be really beneficial if we could strengthen our rules on um, the disclaimers, the information that appears on the face of political ads. And, and this also uh, bleeds into the micro-targeting because one of the problems with the, all these micro-targeting ads is that you get so many iterations of, uh, of the ads because they're all sliced up for, for individual consumption almost that when researchers try, try to go into the databases and, and try and get a handle on what's being said, it, they, they've just flooded the zone. There's too much going on. There are too many different iterations of the ads. And uh, I've heard researchers complain that they just can't get a, a handle on it because the, the information flow is just too overwhelming. Um, let me move to the next question. It's from Yael Eisenstadt at Cornell's Digital Life Initiative, who is also praising the report. Um, Yael has a question for Ellen Weintraub. Um, how can we take some of the same campaign finance rules that apply offline to the digital world? Um, leaving the platform to self-regulate clearly has not been the best protection for our elections. So how do we hold them accountable for following certain rules in political advertising, like tracking money and sources? Um, and I might add that my sense from um, Ellen and Karen is that television ads, uh, TV stations, they say, often negotiate um, with political campaigns or issue advertisers about false claims. And that doesn't seem to be happening in the same way online. Uh, that is absolutely true. And Yael is another great thinker in this uh, space and has made some uh, great contributions uh, in this field. Um, so, um, the, the, the easiest solution, uh, doesn't solve all the problems, would be the Honest Ads Act, which would take the rules that um, apply to uh, disclosure of broadcast ads and import them online to the internet. That, that hasn't happened. I don't know. I don't really understand what the objection is to doing that, but people obviously do have objections to it in Congress because it, it can't seem to get enacted. Um, but there, I, I can't see any any rationale for treating internet ads different from broadcast ads in terms of just the disclosure that goes along with it, the transparency. Uh, and uh, when, the, when the law was written, the internet just, you know, we're, we're talking about a law that, that goes back to uh, the 1970s and was last substantially amended in 2002, which is several eons uh, ago in internet uh, years, right? Uh, so the law talked about broader disclosure requirements for um, what is what are termed electioneering communications, which are defined as ads that only show up broadcast cable satellite. They, by their terms, do not apply to the internet. Uh, even with the best of political will, the FEC could not apply that same set of laws to the internet without statutory authorization. So um, there's, uh, there's one easy fix for that, and it's the Honest Ads Act. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself before I turn to, um, maybe we have time for one more question. Um, so um, this is from Judith Katz at Primary Source, a nonprofit that works in the civics education space. Um, she says, I'm concerned that teachers need to be better informed about these issues so they can work with students to identify misinformation. Do you have any suggestions for us about how to do that? Ellen Goodman, Karen? I'll jump in, but I'm sure Ellen Goodman has more to say about this than I do. Um, uh, I'll just say the, the first thing that's going to make me sound a little curmudgeonly uh, that I always say about media education is I think it's important, but I don't want to put the burden on the individual when I think there is such systemic 
problems. Um, so, but that being said, of course, there's a role for media education and civic education. And, and I would hope that it would be in this space, it could be proactive and, and, um, and, and interactive and involve uh, kids, teachers, uh, citizens in, um, in spotting misinformation, in calling it out, um, in, uh, um, in um, participating more in civic activity through online um, fora. And the way I think we need to do that is, is uh, through some of the mechanisms that Ellen was talking about. Um, you know, when broadcast um, seemed to be, um, or there was a, a worry that it would interfere with education, that it would interfere with localism, that it would interfere with, um, with the arts. Uh, uh, we created um, the um, CPB, which is content, and the PBS, which is distribution, um, to to fill that void. We got Sesame Street and all those kinds of programs, but um, uh, but that was fundamentally still very passive. You know, we could hope for something like that, but much more um, informing and much more interactive uh, to fill some of the gaps that we see evolving because of um, uh, the way the online um, uh, environment is structured. I'm going to jump in with a last question, even though I said that was the last one, because this is something I've been wondering about myself. Um, it comes from Susan Schoenfeld Harris, I think, who's in London. And she says that where she's based, there seems to be an ongoing line that there are no studies demonstrating that misinformation and micro-targeting have had a discernible impact. And so people she talks to says, well, why do you need to control something if there's no proof of impact? And so Susan's wondering, is there work being done to demonstrate the impact beyond how much is being spent by advertisers? Um, it, it's a great question. And I do think, you know, media studies people are, are media impacts are notoriously difficult to, um, uh, to study and to document. I do think there's a lot of work being done on that. But I think we need to think about impacts, not just, you know, is it, did it change your behavior? Did it change your vote? Um, but also, what did it, does it do to the marketplace? What is um, uh, micro-targeting and, and digital advertising um, and the surveillance load do to the marketplace in terms of competition um, and the ability of, of uh, uh, new entrants to have different models of social media? Um, and, and, you know, and sort of the, the issues we've talked about, about faith in institutions. I mean, I, I, so I think that, that the impact, the impacts that we need to study, first of all, I think that there have definitely been documented declining trust in, in institutions due to disinformation and lack of transparency, even if it doesn't change a vote. Um, okay, I think we've hit our one o'clock mark. I don't know if any of um, our excellent panelists want to have a final word, but I think it's been just such a rich and fruitful discussion. Um, I thank you all so much for doing it and for all the work and thinking you're doing in this space. Um, and thank you all for these excellent questions. Um, totally interesting. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thank Take you. care. Stay safe, wash your hands. <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. Thanks for joining us.